somehow when the elders leave you standing here, you feel quite abandoned. I don't know. <laughs> I suppose I can see, see the, the speaker better from down there, but I often wondered why the elders suddenly abandoned the preacher. And uh, <laughs> you suddenly feel quite alone. Well, this morning, <clears throat> I've got a story for the grown-ups, and the kids can listen if they want to. My grandfather, my English grandfather, was a smoker. He liked his cigarettes, and he had a little machine that used to roll his cigarettes, and we'd, when he came to New Zealand, roll his cigarettes for him. We didn't know that handling tobacco was bad for you, just as bad as it is smoking it. And so we would put these cigarette, put this little paper in the machine, and uh, we would put the tobacco in it, and then we'd push this little machine back and forward, zoom, zoom, like that, and the cigarette would roll up, and it would make a real nice, neat-looking cigarette like the bought ones. Just as bad for you, mind you, but uh, Grandpa liked his cigarettes. We used to have to make him 20 cigarettes a day. That doesn't sound all that good, does it? But he thought it was okay. And uh, so he had 20 cigarettes a day, but he liked to smoke something else as well. And that was a pipe. He had two pipes. One pipe used to come down like that and curl around. We liked that pipe. It looked really good. I think Dutch people like those kind of pipes. And he had another kind of pipe, which was a straight one. that came straight out with a bowl on the end. So we liked this idea. We used to make pipes, you see. We would get one of those nuts off a gum tree, scoop out the inside a bit and bore a hole in the side and put a straw in it. And uh, uh, yes, believe it or not, we even smoked some dock leaf in these pipes. <laughs> My brother got very sick over it, actually. <laughs> Grandpa liked his pipe. When he was more relaxed, he would light his pipe. He had a little knife a little pen knife. There it is. I'm not sure if this is the exact same one. I can't remember if he left it behind and I, I got it. It was exactly like that. A little yellow pen knife with a bone handle, a little bit of stuff on the side, a nice uh, a clean little blade. Had this little pen knife which was used for the dirty job of cleaning out his pipe. And uh, so we used to get paid a little bit it might have been threepence or something like that. That's three cents for the kids to clean out Grandpa's pipe. Some of you have done that probably. And you scraped it at the inside and you cleaned all that off, off around the front. Then you twisted it apart and you got some pipe cleaners and you went down it and all the juicy goo and tar and goo came out on the pipe cleaners. And Grandpa thought it was lovely. But, uh, of course, he died of cancer but, uh, and a heart attack. So it maybe wasn't too good. But uh, we used to clean his pipe out. Grandpa took his little knife everywhere. Besides cleaning his pipe, of course, he opened letters with it. He always opened his letters. He was a school teacher, headmaster for 36 years in one school. And so uh, he opened a lot of letters in his day, and this little knife was always with him. And he would carefully insert that into the right place on the envelope, and he would slice the envelope open with his uh, little knife. It was a little treasure. It was part of him, like an extra finger. And he carried it everywhere. Grandpa used to like to go for walks and do the things that we did when he came to visit from England and uh, lived on the farm. And, uh, of course, that meant going out to get cows from the back paddock or forever, uh, where else. And at the end of our farm, there's a great big area of bush, about 3,000 acres of bush, and uh, our cows used to get into the bush. And one day we went to get the cows, some cows that had strayed into the bush, broken down the old rails that we used to have in split of a gate, and then got into the bush. Grandpa said, I'll come with you. And so he took his cigarette supply, which he smoked as he went along, and he took his pipe, which he would have when he got sick of walking, and he'd sit down on an old fallen down tea tree somewhere, and uh, he would uh, deal to his pipe, while we went and looked for the cows. The dogs found the cows and uh, we chased them on the way home. Grandpa sat on the tea tree, fallen tea tree log, and uh, because we weren't there, he evidently got out his knife and cleaned out his pipe. And uh, <coughs> he got it all going right. And we got home with the cows and Grandpa got home again. And when we came to have to clean his pipe about uh, four o'clock in the afternoon before it was milking time, 
Uh, he couldn't find his knife that he'd had for umpteenth dozens of years. And he looked everywhere for his knife and he couldn't find it. He thought, perhaps I've dropped it and lost it, and he looked in his pockets and he turned them inside out because he thought there'd be a hole in his pocket somewhere. But he couldn't find his knife, and so uh, he thought the easiest way to recover a lost item is to tell kids that they would get a reward if they found it. That's always worked, hasn't it? And so we were offered two shillings to find his knife. Now, you've got to remember, kids, that two shillings was a lot of money in those days. Two shillings could buy all kinds of stuff. That's 20 cents. And it could buy all sorts of stuff. Just think of how many. You couldn't eat so much ice cream that you could buy for 20 cents because an ice cream was only one penny. That was only a one twentieth. And so we got this offer, 20 cents to find Grandpa's knife. I thought to myself, I know where his knife is. I'm pretty good at finding things. And uh, so I uh, said to Grandpa, I know where your knife is. It'll be down by the rails into the bush where you sat on the tea tree log and you must have cleaned your pipe and it dropped and we left it on the log. Well, he said, you go and find it and there's 20 cents. So we all ran off fast as we could go to be first to get there to find the knife. And we all got there about the same time. We scratched around and sure enough, underneath a, a, a little flax bush that was growing there was Grandpa's knife. And if it's the same one, that would be from 1953 till now. So work out how long ago that was. And perhaps the knife was 20 or 30 years old even by then. And uh, I grabbed the knife. I don't know whether it's because I was the biggest and the roughest or whatever, but I got the knife and uh, got home with the knife. Grandpa, Grandpa, here's your knife. And uh, he was thrilled to get his knife and he fished around in his pocket to pay the reward because he was an honest man. But he only found four sixpences. Now, four sixpences made up two shillings. And there were four kids. And I wasn't so happy when I thought to myself, doing a quick calculation, being 10 years old, that uh, four kids and four coins didn't sound too good when I thought I was going to get one coin, which was worth as much as the whole four put together. And uh, anyhow, it turns out that Grandpa said we'd all made a great effort, even my little sister, who was three years old, we'd all made such a great effort and had uh, taken the loss of his knife so well and with his very good English, he said, I shall reward you all equally. And so he gave us all sixpence. It wasn't too bad because that bought a lot of ice creams next time we went to town and a bottle of Fanta orange and uh, one or two other things, which wasn't good for our health, but was at least better than the tobacco that Grandpa smoked. <laughs> and so the little knife remains to this day. And if it's the same one, and I think it is, because I can't remember how else I would have got this knife, I still use it for some more delicate kind of work. It sits on the windowsill in front of my little workbench there. I rather like it. I hope I don't lose it. If I lose it, I'll have to offer my forthcoming grandkid a very much greater reward than 20 cents, I'm sure, in order to find it. So that's the story of the little knife. And I want to read you a story about a pen knife <coughs> because this little knife was always called a pen knife. And I'm reading from Jeremiah chapter 36. And I'm going to read the whole chapter, not because uh, I'm lazy, but because you need to get the whole picture. I could preach the whole chapter, but I think I'll read it, and I'm using a new international version. And you might be just as happy to listen to me read it, but look it up in your own Bible if you want to. It's Jeremiah chapter 36, and it reads like this. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah. Remember, Josiah was a good king. Jehoiakim let things slip a lot. Uh, this word came to Jeremiah, who was the prophet, uh, from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words I have spoken to you concerning Israel, Judah, and all other nations from the time I began speaking to you in the reign of Josiah until now. Perhaps when the people of Judah hear about every disaster I plan to inflict on them, each of them will turn from his wicked way, then I will forgive their wickedness and their sins. You see, uh, Jesus is speaking here to, uh, to uh, the prophet, because Jesus is the one who spoke to all the prophets, and uh, Jesus is saying, I want to give these people an opportunity to be 
able to be saved. I want these people to give up their wicked ways and I want it possible for them to be able to be taken, uh, eventually taken to heaven and uh, enjoy a new world, a new earth altogether uh, where there is righteousness and justice and honesty and fairness because that was not the case under the rule of King Jehoiakim. So Jeremiah called Barak the son of Neriah, and while Jeremiah dictated all the words the Lord had spoken to him, Barak wrote them down on the scroll. Then Jeremiah <coughs> told Barak, I am restricted. In other translations, some of them it says, I'm barred from going to the temple. I'm restricted, and I can't go to the Lord's temple. So you go to the house of the Lord on a day of fasting, and read to the people from the scroll the words that the Lord your, uh, that you wrote as I dictated. Read them to all the people of Judah who come in from their towns. Perhaps they'll bring their petition before the Lord, and each will turn from their wicked ways for their, the anger and wrath pronounced against this people by the Lord is great. The Lord had decided that these people would have to undergo punishment. They would have to go undergo reprimand, and uh, maybe they would get things straight. You see, God had said via the prophets that uh, the Babylonians were going to come and take over their country. And so uh, he said, I will give these people one more opportunity. And Jeremiah was the prophet who was to take the message to the king and on to the people. Barak the son of Neriah did everything Jeremiah the prophet told him to do. At the Lord's temple he read the words of the Lord from the scroll. And in the ninth month of the fifth year of Jehoiakim son of Josiah king of Judah, a time of fasting before the Lord was proclaimed for all the people in Jerusalem and those who had come from the towns of Judah and from uh, the room of Gemiah, the son of Shaphan, the secretary, which was in the upper courtyard at the entrance of the new gate of the temple, Barak read to all the people at the Lord's temple the words of Jeremiah uh, from the scroll. Then Micaiah, the son of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, heard all the words the Lord of the Lord from the scroll, and he went down to the secretary's room in the royal palace, where all the officials were sitting. Elishama, the secretary, Deliah, the son of Shemaiah, and Elnathan, the son of Abkor, and Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, and Zedekiah, the son of Hananiah, and all the other officials, that was naming enough of them, wasn't it? But they were all uh, sitting around there because they were discussing what they would do if the Babylonians came. It was a conference. After Micaiah told them everything he had heard, Baruch read to the people from the scroll. All the officials sent Jehudi, son of Nethaniah, the son of Shomaniah, the son of Cushi, just so that you know who these people were related to, to say to Barak, Bring the scroll from which you have read to the people and come. So Barak the son of Neriah went to them with the scroll in his hand and they said to him, Sit down please and read it to us. So Barak read it to them. When they heard all these words they looked at each other in fear and they said to Barak, We must report all these words to the king. They then asked Barak, Tell us, how did you come to write all this? Did Jeremiah dictate it to you? Yes, Barak replied, he dictated all these words to me and I wrote them down in ink on the scroll. Then the official said to Barak, you and Jeremiah go and hide and don't let anyone know where you are. And after they put the scroll in the room of Elishama the secretary, they went to the king in the courtyard and reported everything to him. The king sent Jehudi to get the scroll, and Jehudi brought it from the room of Elishama, the secretary, and he read it to the king and all the officials standing around beside him. It was the ninth month, and the king was sitting in the winter apartment with a fire burning in the fire pot in front of him. And whenever Jehudi had read three or four columns of the scroll, the king 
cut them off with a scribe's knife or a pen knife and he threw them into the fire pot until the entire scroll was burnt in the fire. A whole lot of people were so excited about a message from the Lord and were so keen to see the whole nation repent and to see the king <coughs> encourage the people to repent uh, <coughs> that they went to the king expecting something good from him but the king with absolute disdain took out his little penknife and sliced the parchment into pieces. And he would listen to a page and run his knife down and slice it off and chuck it in the fire. The only use for the message from the Lord from Jeremiah, by Jeremiah, was that it be giving him a little bit of warmth. He would get something out of it, even if it was just to warm his hands for a moment or two while the scroll burned up. The king and all his attendants who heard all these words showed no fear, nor did they tear their clothes. That was a sign of repentance. They didn't do it. Even though El Nathan and Deliah and Gemariah urged the king not to burn the scroll, he would not listen to them. Instead, the king commanded Jeremiel, the son of the king, Seriah, son of Azareel, and uh, Shelemiah, the son of Abdiel, to arrest Barak the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet, but the Lord had hidden them. As far as the king was concerned, a message from Jeremiah the Lord's prophet was of little value whatsoever. It was only worth as much as the uh, calories that could be produced from it to warm his hands on a cold day. After the king had burnt the scroll containing the words which Barak had written at Jeremiah's dictation, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. He says, take another scroll and write on it all the words that were on the first scroll which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, burned up. Also tell Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, this is what the Lord says. You burnt that scroll and you said, why did you write on it that the king of Babylon would certainly come and destroy this land and cut off both men and animals from it. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about Jehoiakim, king of Judah. He will have no one to sit on the throne of David. His body will be thrown out and exposed to the heat by day and the frost by night. I'll punish him and his children and his attendants for their wickedness. I'll bring on them and those living in Jerusalem and the people of Judah every disaster I pronounced against them because they have not listened. So Jeremiah took another scroll, gave it to the scribe Barak, the son of Neriah, and as Jeremiah dictated, Barak wrote on it all the words of the scroll that Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burned in the fire. And many similar words was added to them. This is uh, an interesting story as far as a little bit of history is concerned. But it has meaning for us today as well, even though this occurred um, <clears throat> something like 2,700 years ago. And so I've come to the point where I think I can give my sermon a title, and I've called it The Potentate, the Prophet, and the Penknife. And the story <clears throat> revolves around the penknife, because the penknife was the agent by which the Word of God was separated and cut up and divided up according to the whim of a king instead of the thus saith the Lord of the Lord's prophet. <clears throat> Jehoiakim, being the son of Josiah, uh, should have been one who was responsible and who was to continue the reforms that Josiah had made in the kingdom of Judah. Josiah, we know, uh, was uh, historically a, a good king, and he'd made many reforms. He had, <clears throat> he had changed the people. Their heart conditions had changed considerably in many instances. But as soon as a new king came on the scene, Jehoiakim came on the scene and started a new system of religion, a new system of how the nation was to be run, and who was to be the gods of the nation, who they were to recognize, the people started to go downhill both religiously 
and morally. And soon there was in, uh, injustice practiced again in the nation. Soon the powerful were lording it over the poor. The poor were getting poorer and the rich were getting richer. The rich were getting fewer and the poorer were getting more numerous. And the country was in a mess. And God said, you people know better than to live like this because you have had the benefit of the prophets since the time of Samuel and you have the words of Moses and you know that you are my chosen people and uh, you know that living like this puts you into my disfavor and I cannot take people like you into my kingdom because you will only destroy it. So there were some reasons that we could cite for the condemnation of King Jehoiakim. Um, King Jehoiakim eventually was uh, uh, taken by the Babylonians. Um, they gouged out his eyes and he never did see the land of his captivity and uh, he had a pretty miserable end. All because he decided to cut up the word of the Lord and burn it in the fire just to warm his hands. Really an act of rebellion, a demonstration of rebellion. And so I've listed a few things here that we might take note of, and uh, this act that he committed in defiance of the luminous evidence that Jeremiah's message was the word of God. It was known to him without a shadow of a doubt that this was the word of God. And in sight of that evidence, um, the rejection of it in such a decided way, um, of course, uh, mitigates against him. And of course, hadn't the psalmist uh, talked a lot about the light that comes from God's word? They had the psalms of David, and, and they were able then to, to, uh, to know that to walk in the light, as Jesus had uh, summarized it, uh, walk in the light while you have the light. And the only light that Jehoiakim got from the word of Jeremiah, the Lord's word, was the little flicker that came from its consum being consumed in the fire. Number two, we might say that he rejected not only a message of threatened wrath by God, but also the entreaty of his advisers and his helpers who begged him not to burn the scroll. At least you might have thought he would have taken some notice of those people whom he had trusted during his uh, reign, his advisers, his helpers, the princes, his uh, own sons, and uh, they were advising him not to burn the scroll, but he rejected their advice as well. And uh, so uh, we have to say that this was a deliberate act of, uh, of warfare against God. The message that came to the last, uh, at the end of the message to the seven churches was a message which would have been very fitting for King Jehoiakim. Repent and hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The end of Revelation chapter 3, isn't it? Repent and hear what the Lord says to the churches. But because you and I are members of the church, isn't it just as relevant for us to say, and just as real for us to say, repent and hear what the Lord says to the members of the church? And if you think that means everybody else except me, you could quite justly adjust it again to say, repent and hear what the Spirit says unto me, a church member. And so uh, we have uh, uh, just reason to, to see that uh, Jehoiakim was very much in opposition to God. His act was committed in spite of his earnest pleas from some of his advisers who stood by. He was taking no notice of anyone but himself. See, one of God's redemptive, redemptive acts is to send messages via his prophets. It's just as much a redemptive act to get a message from God's prophet as it is to get a message from Jesus himself or to repeat something or have take to heart something which Jesus uh, actually is recorded as saying in some of his preaching messages because the words of the prophets, whoever they were, came from Jesus anyhow 
is just that they came largely before Jesus came to this earth, but sometimes afterwards. So it's just as important that we take notice of the prophets of old as the words of Jesus. <clears throat> and it's a redemptive act that God sends his prophets with a message which becomes part of God's words to us, just as much as a redemptive act as it is for Jesus to do the things that he did, such as healing the sick and raising the dead, and eventually, of course, giving his life. It's all part of a whole package which we call redemption. And without the work of the prophets, we would have no reason to see the validity in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. It would be an event unaccounted for and of little uh, worth to us unless we see it in the whole picture of what Jesus has done to redeem us and win us back to him. Another reason that we could say uh, Jehoiakim uh, had uh, really gone off the track here was that this act was done on a very special feast day. And a feast day was a day when people were to give their special thought and attention to spiritual matters. And uh, because they would take <coughs> uh, these, uh, because he, he would take uh, the scroll which was read to the people on this day and show such disdain for it and destroy it and cut it up and burn it, it was a despicable thing because on a feast day the people should have had opportunity to hear the words of God's prophets and to take them to heart. Today is the day of salvation, the scripture tells us. The day today is the day of salvation. For some of those people, that day was the day when they would be most susceptible to hearing a word from the prophet. There was the threat of the Babylonians on the one hand, and uh, there was the message from the prophet on the other. They were aware of the political conditions of the time, and for some of them that day, a special fast day when they did not have to work that day, they didn't have to go and keep the boss happy, they could give their time to spiritual thought and reflection, and uh, this was the day for some of them, the day of salvation. And that's not too much different for us today, is it? The day of salvation is today because you don't have tomorrow yet and maybe tomorrow will not come. For some people today in this country will be their last day. For some people in other countries it will be their last day. The other day for a good number of people in Spain it was their last day as the train derailed and about 130 or 150 people were killed. A um, hundred, <coughs> hundred or so people killed in an earthquake and landslide in China the other day. Today is the day of salvation. And Jehoiakim should have given those people that opportunity of the special feast rest day. They call them feast days often. Fasting day. He should have given them their opportunity to make their peace with God because very soon the Babylonians may be taking them over. <clears throat> it gave evidence that he was a fool, a fool who rejected the word of God, using his own judgments instead of the sure and certain knowledge of God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no what? There is no God. The fool. Well, <clears throat> the foolishness of rejecting the word of God can lead us even today into a situation where we will take out our spiritual pen knife, our mental pen knife, and decide that we will take what we want of God's word, or we will discard what we don't want of God's word. The human heart is deceitful above all things. And how easy it is for us to rationalize that some parts of God's word are valid today and other parts are not. I've heard preachers, I've heard Seventh-day Adventist preachers, believe it or not, say that there are some parts of Scripture that are no longer valid as far as we are concerned living in this day and age. And I would challenge such thinking all the way because the Bible stands as a whole. God's Word stands as a whole. The prophets do not contradict each other. 
the prophets stand side by side and uh, although they may not present things word for word, the understanding, the concepts, the big deep thoughts in the prophetic messages are all aligned equally and uh, they are to be taken as the word of God. And for us to make decisions, to take our penknife and decide that we will cut out and incise what we think is irrelevant for us today is really acting God. And we are putting